and I wish to acknowledge my appreciation to my very dear friend, Mr. Sheshadri Chari. He's been a long dear friend with me and uh, for all the encouragement that he's been giving me over the years and to Dr. Ramakumar for this very gracious invitation there. Uh, in the time that is given to me, I would like to basically flag off a few points which has been well elucidated by the previous speakers and more specifically by Komodo Vasan. What I like to uh, present today here is a kind of a dossier from Wuhan to Mamalapuram. In this context, I would like to basically look into uh, a pot, a, an academic policy research perspective of India and China. And therefore, I would like to title this presentation as India and China in the Age of Competition, Cooperation and Convergence from Civilizational Salience to Contemporary Dynamics. This indeed is something that um, we need to basically understand because the Euro-Atlantic has been actually replaced by what we could call as the Indo-Pacific era there since the age of globalization there. Let me at the outset outline a few propositions as to why India and China could be called as civilizational powers and not nation states actually there. One of the reasons why India and China have been on this collision course is that we have understood India and China more as a nation state from a very Eurocentric Westphalian understanding there. But if you look at Asia, Asia is known for what is called as millennium civilizations. Civilizations that has gone beyond 3,000 years. And therefore, if you look at civilizations, the entire concept of a sovereign nation doesn't exist, but there is what is called as an international society that existed in the ancient period actually there. In contemporary international relations, we call this as the English school of international relations, which actually emphasizes on international society rather than international relations. The moment you bring in the political aspect into it, you come in terms of borders, boundaries, you come in terms of the understanding of how borders are drawn, boundaries are drawn. Therefore, this entire concept of the India-China standoff in the boundary issue is actually a cartographic aggression that the Chinese have done into it there. And the reason is, is that, that if you do not have a cartographic understanding that is mutually acceptable to both sides, you are likely to have a perennial conflict. Whereas if you look at it from an identity perspective, which is called a social constructivism, we look into countries as societies actually. There is an, there's an Indian society, there's a Chinese society of civilizational millennium actually there. There we never had any borders and boundaries. There are free flow of people in terms of pilgrims, in terms of traders, in terms of embassies. And that is why Mamalaburam comes in here. There was a state structure, but there was something that was called as a flexible borders and boundaries. The moment the cartographic division came as what was called the, the Ratcliffe line, the Eng Husbandman line, these are lines which comes out of the imperial colonial division that actually pitches India and China into a conflict. This is my first proposition there. Secondly, India and China cannot be called as rising powers. This is a Western term that has been given to us. India and China are actually civilizational aspirational powers, which means each of these civilizations, they have their own worldviews, long histories, vast geographies, their psyches are completely different and therefore the understanding of each other needs to go deep into that if you have to resolve the core issues there. And I think in all these 70 years, I think what Prime Minister Modi has done is actually addressing the social, cultural identity issue and that is where the root cause of the problem could be addressed into it. You, you can have endless number of joint working group meetings, but these meetings have not produced any result. And therefore, the quintessence of what is called as informal diplomacy comes into it. It is better that at the summit level, both leaders could space out, argue out. And when you don't have any kind of fixed agenda in the absence of officials, both leaders can open their minds and there is a lot of flexibility of give and take actually there. So this is where India's approach in the recent years has been quite fruitful actually. But I'm not saying that we have solved all the problems. But all that India has done is a good start, which is how we could come into that there. So what does history inform about India-China relations? India-China relations historically has informed peaceful people-to-people -people relations, peaceful trade, and benign relations between both states. There's not been a war fought until 1962 actually there. And that again is a misunderstood, misconceived, cartographic division that came between India and, 
and uh, <clears throat> and china actually there. so therefore this is something that we need to address and that is the reason we find that the imperial colonial period for both countries has been a, a period of setback actually there because until the 18th century we find that india and china are preeminent global economic powers and therefore they go into a interregnum and then they're coming back into that secondly you have a lot of challenges of growth and development both nations because both nations have got vast territories vast populations and the expectations of these people are tremendous actually therefore there's a lot of pressure on the governance system of these two countries and therefore they have to deliver into it that pressure has come on new delhi that pressure has come on beijing and that's the reason why these two powers have come into it that's the domestic dimension in the foreign policy dimension we find that china today is a center of international opprobrium it is a center of international opprobrium because in the 1990s china was was been branded as what is called as a peaceful rising state but as you come to the era of hu jintao and xi jinping we find that china has been what is called as an assert, assertive state actually there therefore there's been a lot of debate that has been going on in the west whether china is called as a bismarckian power a bismarckian power resembles what is called kaiser's germany which was actually expanding in europe actually and that brought in the entire brunt and pressure of the united states led hub and spokes arrangement in the asia pacific and the indo pacific to put pressure on china there so what the united states has been doing all these years is to engage with china at the same time contain into it but by and by and large if you look into the 70 years of relations that we had with with china india has had always a benign relations india has always been defensive defense india has never occupied a single square kilometer of chinese territory there rather we have we have lost territory in many of those terms actually there and that is primarily because in terms of the global strategic balance between in the cold war period as well as in the post cold war period actually there and therefore the major challenge between india and china today which is the third proposition i would like to lay is what is called as a perceptions management at the level of the summit leadership how do prime minister modi and president xi jinping look into each other in terms of perceptions they have about these two countries there so mamalapuram will be a kind of a relaxed view in which they could in in a stroll in the beach they could look into what is called the perceptions between the two countries there you need to have a little bit of what is called as loud talking argument if if necessary so that this has been thrashed out actually there i'm saying this because this is a very successful diplomacy call informal diplomacy because prior to the united states soviet union detente came into effect we find the presidents of the united states and the soviet union did engage in a lot amount of informal talking there we always are reminded of president nixon's visit to beijing in 1972 when the united states opened up to china president nixon traveled all the way to <coughs> to what is called as uh, uh, zhongnan hai to meet mao zedong so therefore this summit diplomacy has its own advantages it's got its own disadvantages also there so china actually contains a very hostile us led hub and spokes arrangement in the indo pacific there are a lot of misgivings about the belt road initiative because china has been looked as a very what you could call as a predatory power china is as practicing what is called as predatory capitalism into which it is looking into an extortive aspect of development actually the development when when a big power gives to other countries it is always on a benign note china wants to replicate a marshall plan but the marshall plan what the united states did had a lot of forgiving of debt but the chinese are are not forgiving in terms of debt actually that but wherever india has gone in trying to build up capacity particularly in afghanistan india has sacrificed more in terms of the investment of of infrastructure development and therefore india has better credentials of what is called as an attractive soft power in global politics actually there interestingly india is a member of two trilaterals in the indo pacific one is the united states japan india the other is the russia india china trilateral there therefore india is actually a very good balancer in what is called as an emerging economic as well as geo economic and geo strategic environment in the asia pacific and indo pacific there so what are the challenges that india is facing into it india faces a different kind of challenge we have a power asymmetry with china i think komodo wasan elucidated it very well actually china is about five times larger in economy 
The Chinese military capacity is approximately eight to nine times more powerful than India. Their, their nuclear arsenal is burgeoning. Their advances in cyberspace warfare and the kind of directed energy weapons, scalar weaponry, the Chinese have gone into, into cutting edge. So much so in the recent, uh, you know, the, the, the parade that took place, it has actually sent very serious messages both to both Washington DC and Brussels actually there. And therefore, India is also caught in what is called as a security dilemma. And the security dilemma is a two-front war with Pakistan on one side and China on the other side there. But this is more of a perception because any war between India and Pakistan and India and China will easily escalate into a nuclear war within seven days. The reason because we did what is called as Exercise Mao in 2003 where we, we looked into the 72 scales of escalation in an India Pakistan, China conflict. It is a no win-win situation for all the three powers there. That includes China, that includes India, that includes Pakistan. So what do we need to do into it? The need of the hour is that we need to talk in terms of credible confidence, security, building mechanisms and military risk reduction measures, nuclear risk reduction measures with China there. Pakistan, we could, we could tackle them on a different level out. But, but if you reach this sense of strategic stability with China, and then with this informal summit that could go into it, we are actually crossing the bridge halfway through there. In this whole thing, we find that the Chinese in recent years, ever since Doklam, have rapidly built up their forces in the Tibetan Autonomous Region Plateau. Today, their Category 1 divisions have increased by a force of 200,000 they have deployed in, in, in Tibetan Autonomous Region. In the reorganized Western theater of Kashgar, Djibouti, uh, Gawadar and Djibouti, the Chinese have proposed to deploy 100,000 naval infantry into Djibouti and Gawadar actually there. So if you look into all these maps, I think Amada Vasan will basically say that this is an encirclement of India there. And therefore, we, we have to look into it because the Chinese on one side would like to talk to us, but the other side, they would like to launch what, is, what I call a components pressure on India. And therefore, we need to equal off or square off this particular situation. Therefore, what is the strategy there? We have our own contentions in Kashmir. The Chinese have their own contentions in, in Hong Kong. The Chinese are, are going to contend with regard to Ladakh because Ladakh has been declared as a union territory by 31st October 2019 when the, uh, when the Jammu Kashmir uh, Reorganization Act comes into being, the Chinese will start protesting into it there. So it is in this context we find that President Xi is coming to Mamalaburam to meet. And I think one of the points that he is likely to raise will be the Ladakh issue there. So this is something that our Prime Minister will be doing a lot of homework to how to counter the Chinese uh, presence into it there. I think the Wuhan summit very well resolved the Doklam crisis. And therefore, I think the Mamalapuram, uh, the Mamalapuram summit will be one into which it will open up positive aspects for, for China there. What is the strength of informal diplomacy? There are seven strengths of informal diplomacy. First and foremost, informal diplomacy provides flexibility of talks which are actually deliberative in nature, where there is what is called as note taking on both sides. Secondly, there is an absence of time scale on any particular issue. You're not under pressure to solve these problems, actually. They're not joint working groups there. Thirdly, there is an informal setting into which both leaders could talk with a lot of relaxation. There's no pressure for the leaders from what is called the officials, actually, there. One of the pressures that come on the heads of government and heads of state is how the diplomats and the, and the bureaucrats will try to give constant inputs, which sometimes they're not able to prioritize what they should put into that there. Fourthly, it, re, it enables them to reach a broad consensus. This is something that Mamalapuram would, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that would achieve into it. A broad consensus on three issues. Number one, a broad consensus on a non-escalation of tensions between India and China there. Because a non-escalation of tensions between India and China is a win-win situation for both countries, primarily for the reason because that now the United States is pressurizing China, tomorrow India will also be in the same level where China is. We have to realize that actually. That. Because any aspirational power in a global system, when there is a power transition that takes place, the dominant hegemon will never allow the rising powers to stabilize. It was a time into which the United States used China against the USSR and finished them off. Now it is time for the United States to use India to finish up China. So therefore we need to look into, into game theory models which Graham T. Allison speaks in what is called the prisoner's dilemma. 
the prisoner's dilemma is one in which both India and China should realize in what dilemma that each of them will come in the next round of trade negotiations there. Already we find that the United States has not conceded in terms of trade talks with India. Despite all the success of Prime Minister Modi's visit, the US has not yielded ground with regard to India on trade actually there. Whereas India has been treated by the United States as only a military sales partner, not a natural ally there. Please go to the State Department as well as the Pentagon list to find how they categorize India into it. We are actually buyers of equipment. This whole aspect of interoperability is only superficial actually. The US doesn't come to that level there. More importantly, fifthly, India and China at the informal diplomacy will be able to build the menu for confidence building mechanisms, nuclear risk reduction measures, and maritime risk measures because we will have an avoidance of incidents on high seas. This is something that we have to look into that there. Why is this divergence that has been between India and China? The number one reason is China has a different global view. India has got a different global view. The Chinese international relations global view is a tributary system. Chinese think themselves in a hierarchical model into which they are the epicenter of the global order, the Middle Kingdom complex. And the tri tributary system is one that pacifies everybody else. And what China has been doing in the past during the age of the emperors and now is to promote what is called as culture, civilization, commerce and connectivity. This culture, civilization, commerce and connectivity was the silk roads in the ancient period and that is how they were even reinvented in the present task actually there. Therefore, they have three important heavens. The first heaven is East Asia, the second heaven is Southeast Asia and the third heaven is basically South Asia there actually. And therefore, Chinese views of South Asia is that they do not consider India to be an Indocentric but they consider South Asia to be a unified heaven itself. This is where we have to understand and infer the Chinese thinking there. Secondly, in the tributary system, there is always what is called the superior subordinate relations. India doesn't have that kind of relations. India treats everybody as equal peers. That is how the spirit of Panchashil has been there, actually. there. And the Belt Road system is nothing but a classic example of predatory capitalism where the Chinese have turned out to be what is called the international money lenders of extorting the price where these hapless countries are now slaves to that there. And therefore, the Chinese think that this is something that is given to them there. Secondly, the Chinese consider that since they are going to be better positioned in the, in the second half of the, of the 21st century, they think that they could do whatever they like into that. That's the reason why that the assertive rise of China is now met with a very strong resistance from the United States, Japan, Australia and other countries actually there. And therefore, there are two views of China. One view of China is that, that China will be an aggressive power. The other view of China is that China will be an accommodative power. That China will be an accommodative power is subject to the fact as to how the major powers surrounding China's periphery manage the relations in perceptions management and strategic management there. So who are China's neighbors? The largest neighbor is India and next to that would be Japan. Korea and other countries are all Chinese-sized because the Han domination is very strong in Southeast Asia, in, in particularly in Vietnam, in the Korean Peninsula, and therefore Japan and India stand out. Therefore, this is where we have to sign both perceptions management and strategic management. We have to be very careful. So what is India's worldview? India's worldview is the Rajamandala approach. India believes in the three concentric circles of the immediate, intermediate, and the extended neighborhood, actually. Then. And as, as Kautilya mentioned, in the immediate neighborhood, you have enmity. In the extended neighborhood, you have what is called as amity. And therefore, how to balance the enmity of the immediate neighborhood is to have partnerships in the intermediate as well as the extended neighborhood. That is what we've been doing, the Actis policy, which has been largely successful there. Even as India has got three concentric circles of the immediate neighborhood, intermediate neighborhood, and the extended neighborhood, the Chinese have their own island chain strategy of called the first island chain, the second island chain, and the third island chain. So if you have a map today, if you superimpose the three island chains of China and the three mandalas of India, we intersect and cross into each other's spheres of influence. This is an area into which we might either go in for cooperation, we might go in for competition, or we might go for convergence. So these are three outcomes that could come out of this particular aspect there. 
Civilizationally speaking, India and China are maritime powers. The Indian maritime tradition goes back to Raja Raja Chola. That was the first Actis policy when Raja Raja Chola set all the way into what is called as into the South China Sea, past the Straits of Malacca, actually. There. And the Chinese Zhangho expedition comes down in round about the 15th century there. So when this particular maritime tradition came into that, there was never a clash between India and China at all. Because the ancient period had, had an international law that was based upon customs and norms. Whereas in the modern stage we find that the international law is completely changed into that. And China is no respecter of that. China respects international law in as much as in a selective basis. And we have the United States which does not respect the law of the sea that comes into it. And I, mean, I thought I'll speak on Mamalaburam, but that's been quite mentioned in it. Now, let me finally come to the areas of, of contrast between India and China, and then I'll conclude into it. As the two leaders approach Mamalaburam, the first contentious issue that both the leaders will face is Ladakh. And I'm pretty sure that Prime Minister Xi would raise it in the context of declaring Ladakh as a union territory there. But I think that basically comes on the Indian side. And I think India has its own reservations on SIPAC, that is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So this is one irritation that will come between them then. Secondly, there is a positive note that comes into it because China and India have, have a project called the China-India Plus, and we've been now training the Afghan diplomats. So there is a convergence between India and China with regard to Afghanistan, with regard to Bangladesh, with regard to Bhutan, with regard to Nepal, actually. So this is one particular area which is called, that is wherever you are able to cooperate, you should use the fruits of cooperation to address the, the areas of conflict. This is called as functionalism actually then. India has opposition to BCM, BCIM, because BCIM is one of the six roots of the Belt Road Initiative there. So I think India needs to go back into BCIM to see where our role is there. The reason I'm saying this is because the bank that funds the BRI, which is the Asia Investment Infrastructure Bank, India has a capital investment of $10 billion. So how do we use this $10 billion we have put into it? We don't give everything to the Chinese actually there. So as an investor, what will be India's bargaining stakes is something that, uh, that the Indian leadership needs to ask, ask into that. Thirdly, there is one reason, there's one area where India, I think, should go in for a, a credible response. That China has been proposing a two plus two talks. That is the foreign secretaries, foreign defense secretaries, foreign ministers, different ministries talks. I think we need to make our own stand here so that this becomes institutionalized. Thirdly, I mean, for fourthly, we find that India needs to play a stronger role in the RIC, the Russia-India-China -Chi China triangle, actually, there. Because unless we play a role in the multilateral forum where China is, our leverage over China will be very difficult. We, we cannot be reluctant there, actually. Because India is actually punching its power much below what it has, actually. So we need to optimize on these resources there. Then, of course, we have the trade issue, particularly the 5G and the Hawaii. I think we need to be more scrupulous, I mean, we need to be more scrutinizing into the impact of 5G as well as Hawaii and see how much that could come to that then. And finally, uh, what are the outcomes or what are the uh, uh, possible cooperative issues that could come into it? The first area where India and China could cooperate is blue economy in the Indian Ocean region there. I think India has uh, certain strengths which it can leverage with China into developing Indian Ocean as a, as, a, as a zone of peace in terms of the blue economy. Blue economy is the next frontier of the global economy, even as the land-based resources are running out into it. I say this because China is already mining the Indian Ocean region. 10,000 square kilometers of the central Indian o Ocean Ridge has been given to China by the International Seabed Authority. And therefore, India has to go in for this particular mining that has to go into this region there. Second area where India should cooperate with China, or rather try to uh, you know, address this whole thing, is on infrastructure diplomacy. China has been predatory in its nature. India has been benign. I think the strengths of India's benign diplomacy will be something of a great help for the smaller states of Southern Asia. So wherever I think uh, uh, that India could do it will be in, in, in what is called as the, uh, the uh, East Africa corridor, the South Asia East Africa growth corridor with Japan. That will be an area where we could leverage into it. Thirdly, I think both countries could cooperate in terms of counter-terrorism, counter-insurgency, and counter-piracy on the seas, actually. Then. 
and therefore uh, a credible maritime risk reduction measures between the two navies would be something in the offing actually there. Fourthly, we have to look into what is called as governance capacity building in these countries actually. I think India and China could share their administrative experience, train the bureaucracies of these smaller countries of the region. Therefore, that will become a larger project of India's participation in the China-India plus. Well, India cannot match China for the dollar that they put in, but India can match and even more weigh the Chinese in terms of capacity building in technical assistance programs where we could give to many of these countries there. So this is where I think that the, the road lies ahead into it. And finally, what are the irritants that, that India has to address? Number one irritant is basically in terms of the nuclear field. Even as China's nuclear arsenal is, is enlarging into it, India has to come into a very stable regime of nuclear risk reduction measures with China there. And in the prospect of a two-front war, I think it is not only coercion that builds into it, we need to build the premises of strategic stability. And that is where we need to address this nuclear risk reduction measures with China in a credible way there. Secondly, we need to address China in terms of what is called the hotline agreement actually there. So that we can avoid the Doklam kind of flares, flares up that, that could come in the future. And thirdly, most importantly, that India and China should have a certain understanding in outer space. Because a weaponization of space by the Chinese is not for India's good. And therefore, there must be some kind of strategic stability that, that could come between these two hours, between, between these two powers there. So, Mamalapuram has a plate full, and I think the leaders of these two countries are much mature enough because the global scenario, as been well pointed out, is now heading towards a downturn. It's heading towards what is called as long cycles of war, and therefore, we find that the imperatives of the Asian powers to cooperate, converge, and then build up a stable relationship for a peaceful Asia-Pacific order is an imperative. Thank you very much and God bless you.